Hello, I'm Brenda Hassinger, and I'm a member of the Hagerstown Community College Alumni Association, and I'm one of two vice presidents for social activities for the group. The Alumni Association is pleased today to bring you a special program in the second of our series to help keep you connected with the college during the COVID crisis when it's not so easy for us to get together in person. Today we are pleased to showcase a presentation by Dr. James Williams. Dr. Williams is a clinical associate professor of emergency medicine at Texas Tech and he's currently on staff at Meredith Medical Center and he's worked many hours with COVID patients from our vicinity. With COVID a big concern for everyone worldwide and at the forefront of our minds, we are happy that Dr. Williams will be presenting his talk today, COVID-19 World Pandemic, Where Have We Been? Where are we now and where are we going? Now let's turn the presentation over to Dr. Williams. Hey, how are you? My name is Dr. James Williams. I'm a clinical associate professor of emergency medicine at Texas Tech University, but also here at Meredith Medical Center in Hagerstown, Maryland. So I was asked by Sharonda Brown, she's a clinical research coordinator and specialist to give a talk to the TORCH group primarily about COVID-19. And what I thought I'd do is talk about sort of where we've been and where we are and, and where we're going over this 14 month trajectory to sort of help you understand a little bit about the pandemic and, and how most importantly you can avoid getting it yourself and if so, what to do, uh, but also understand the bigger picture of what really the pandemic has um, involved. So with that, let's get started. So again, what I'd like to do is talk about where we've been, where we are, where we're going. And with each one of those categories, I'm going to break it down into three components. <clears throat> and those are going to be the epidemiologic components, the medical components, and the logistical components. Because I'm sure as you remember, not just in the medical field, but also elsewhere, there have been shortages, there have been challenges with distribution uh, in whatever segment it has been, whether it's medical or non-medical. Um, and they really have an incredible interplay. Um, and I think you can't look at one without considering the other. So where we've been, this is a series of pictures that sort of give you an overview of, of where we've been thus far. I remember when it started, it was really challenging because this is a novel disease. Remember, even though we know it's a coronavirus, it's a novel coronavirus, and that's why it's called SARS-CoV-19 for 2019 when it was um, evolved in uh, China. So. We didn't know exactly specifically how this is going to react relative to other viruses. And we know that even from season to season, an influenza coronavirus has different um, significance and severity. And so too, we thought this is probably going to be different. But what was really challenging about this is at the time, we didn't even have a way to identify it. We didn't have any rapid test. So when we have, as an example, the seasonal flu, I can do a swab of someone's nasopharynx and in the right time with the right symptoms, with the test, I can say with a high degree of certainty whether somebody does or doesn't have the flu. Well, with that, we didn't really know if they've had this SARS-CoV um, virus or not. And the reason that it's so significant is because it's a very different disease. It's much more uh, fatal than the typical seasonal influenza virus. And it's much more transmissible. You remember what they talked about with r naught, how, how much one person can spread it to somebody else. This is much higher in r naught than the traditional seasonal flus. And so for those reasons, we really were working blindly. And so we didn't even know how to treat these patients, um, even if we didn't know, you know, did they have it? So early on, we treated it typically as with a, a influenza type of pneumonia, we would give them fluids, supportive care, sometimes antibiotics because they can be accompanied with a uh, bacterial infection. And we thought at the time, because somebody would have such a terrible uh, lung disease, as this x-ray in the middle shows, that we thought that if we would intubate them early, that would mitigate some of the pulmonary complications and then some of the downstream complications. Well, so talking about the x-ray, if you are not familiar with x-rays, uh, what's black is air and what's white is bone or very dense. And so on this image, you can see the to the right is uh, 
somebody's left side and similarly on our left side as we're looking at that's the patient's left the heart is the round thing in the middle and what should be nice and black uh, in the lungs it has all these cotton ball appearances well those are the ground glass opacities that you've probably heard about that show a significant um, viral infection of somebody's lungs and that's indeed what this is to the left it showed one of the significantly complicated algorithms to try to figure out who in the world has has uh, COVID-2 and then we have to try to figure out what do we do about that epidemiologically to the right, it sort of gives you a depiction um, to really bring you into my world. What's it like in the emergency department when you hear about these patients getting intubated? You've seen some of the pictures on the news, perhaps. But in this picture, it's a negative pressure room, which tries to um, minimize any airflow into the care providers and get it out to filtration systems. It's incredibly uh, labor intensive. So we have four people in here. The person on the left, that's the respiratory therapist and two nurses, myself, the patient, it um, seems to get really crowded really quickly because you have a lot of equipment to care for some of these patients. You can see the ventilator there is just one piece of the equipment with all the monitoring and, and other things we need. Look at the uh, PPE, or the personal protective equipment that everybody has. It's not just a mask, but an N95 mask, the face shield, the gowns, the, the gloves that, that's required. It's really labor intensive and resource intensive as well. Well, on the top, um, supportive care, that also included some convalescent plasma. And so it was really a cool thing early on. We felt that if we had patients who got infected with COVID-19, but then recovered without a significant illness, that in all likelihood, they had some antibodies that helped them fight the virus. That's why they did well and survived. So if we can get plasma from those patients and anybody else and pull them, then we'll be able to extract the antibodies from those patients and then give them to somebody who's not doing so well and in doing so, we'll be able to boost their immunity, boost their defense against the virus, put down the virus, minimize the viral load, and help that patient recover. And that was a really interesting concept early on, and it has been shown to have some benefit. Well, where we've been epidemiologically, I think everybody can remember seeing these incredible maps, whether it's on the news or put out by Johns Hopkins, uh, they had the virus tracker that told you county by county throughout the US and indeed the world, how severe the infection was. Our first hotspot, of course, was the state of Washington, followed by New York, and then to a lesser extent, California. And over the 14 months course, all the states in between have waxed and waned with their severity. So early on on the right, this is one of the uh, disease trackers by Hopkins. It shows um, in Hagerstown up here in Washington County, we actually had a pretty mild um, run early on, but it turns out then at the end of 2020, and uh, in January particularly, we really did have a high viral load in the community and there was a high degree of um, infectivity. It really is fortunately they're going down now. Well, not only did it have an impact certainly on individuals um, and states, but also the economy. And you can see from this um, line that the virus really did just battered the economy. So logistically, where have we been? It's been a challenge to ramp up to provide everybody the PPE. So not only is any one patient have a much higher demand for all the care providers to wear PPE, but then of course, as the saying goes, this has been a pandemic, it's viral. The numbers of patients who require that have been exponentially higher too. And so you can see on the left of some of the PPE that's required, um, the, the masks, the gloves, gowns, etc. But then also what to do about where we keep these patients? So at Meredith, they built a temporary structure it's shown here on the left outside of the emergency department in case we needed to have overflow capacity uh, for patients. So remarkably at Meredith, what they were able to do within, it was approximately the first six months, is to build an entire unit dedicated for the care of COVID patients. From ground up, a fully functional, not a temporary structure, but a fully functional wing of the hospital, specifically for these patients. It's been remarkable that they've been able to do that. Well, on the right also, it shows how it's affected nationally. This is Reagan National, a picture of the concourse, which normally is just packed with people in here. There are about two people in that whole concourse. Well, logistically, independent of the equipment, it's really important to consider what happens about the people, because you can't take care of patients without people. And that goes anywhere, uh, whether it's doctors or nurses, but probably more importantly, the, the techs, whether it's the phlebotomists, x-ray techs, respiratory therapists, the clerks, housekeeping, all these people are required to make the unit go. If you take out any one of those people, 
from an infection, then the downstream implications of that are dramatic. And indeed, we saw that in New York and New York City early on in the pandemic. Not only did they have an incredibly uh, high demand for services that outstripped their supply, but then the existing supply that they had started to get knocked down because individual providers were getting ill as well. So speaking of that, I also want to talk about where we've been. I have to give a special um, note of respect to my dear friend, Dr. Juan Fitz. I worked with Juan for 10 years side by side in the emergency department. Juan was an amazing colleague. He trained hundreds and thousands of medical students, of residents, nurses, other physicians too, and truly gave his life caring for patients. He caught and later succumbed to COVID uh, last year. And to the left is a picture of Juan and uh, he was highlighted on the nightly news and they had a special tribute of him uh, in a Sunday morning news show. And to the right is a special um, memorial we had for Juan uh, the day he passed away um, in the very hospital's ICU where he had worked for so long and cared for so many patients. So I think it's really important that we do just pay a bit of respect for the people who are taking care of um, the COVID patients who have put their lives on the line and indeed people who have actually given their lives um, caring for others. So where are we now? Uh, we really have made a terrific transition, I think, going towards the vaccine. This is a picture of me getting my first vaccine, and this was early in December. And <clears throat> I'd like to credit Meredith for doing an incredible job of getting vaccines out and really dispensing them to their providers very efficiently. And even now, just three months later, we have fully one third of the county's population who are older than 65 vaccinated with their first shot. So we've really done a remarkable job locally. And then as Wall Street Journal puts out early in December that the vaccinations have begun nationally. Well, what about medically, where are we? So in distinction to where we were early on, we know a whole lot more about this disease. We can identify who has it. We can risk stratify where they are on their disease progression and really tailor the treatment depending on where they fit along that timeline of disease progression. So we know that Antibiotics might be useful short term, but by and large, we're able to distinguish now who does or who doesn't have a bacterial super infection and we can withdraw antibiotics as early as possible to mitigate some of their potential side effects. We know that intubation early is not a good thing. We're much more adept at using high flow nasal cannula to get patients over the hump of their oxygen requirements. Steroids are an incredible resource, but it's interesting also for both the steroids and the remdesivir that they're useful by and large patients who are already hospitalized. It's been shown that if you give these to patients who are ambulatory and really not too sick, that not only does it not help them, but in fact, it could hurt them. And that's similar to monoclonal antibodies in distinction to patients who are hospitalized that require the steroids and remdesivir, the monoclonal antibodies are helpful actually in those groups who are treated as an outpatient within the first 10 days of illness, but who also have some comorbidities. So if you're an asymptomatic carrier and you've tested positive, probably not going to help. But if let's say you're 65 or 85 and you have congestive heart failure and diabetes or you're overweight, still don't need hospitalization, that's a case in which the monoclonal antibodies may help you. And this is similar uh, to the convalescent plasma. The concept is that these are artificially manufactured antibodies specifically to the spike protein. So it gives your body a defense that it can actually attack the virus and prevent that spike protein from attaching to one of the host cells. And it decreases the viral load. And in doing so, it decreases the hospitalizations that are required for patients infected with disease. There are also some other things that are um, in investigation right now. So the cytokine inhibitors, IL-6, there are three uh, that look to suppress the, your body's inflammation. Remarkably, that sometimes there's uh, something called a COVID storm in which your body's immune system, which is normally a good thing, gets ramped up too much and overwhelms the body and needs to be tampered down because what happens is this COVID storm releases so many inflammatory markers and interleukins that your body is just an inflammatory storm and it actually hurts your body. So the IL-6 inhibitors try to suppress that. And we know also clearly that supportive care is key because anytime you have one system that's affected uh, on top of another, as an example, if kidneys start to fail in addition to lung failure, your morbidity and mortality increases dramatically. So we wanna minimize that. So sort of the overview of 
of where we look at things right now um, is on the top right. It's a way to sort of risk stratify somebody. And there are several categories that we can put somebody to decide how can we really best help them get over their COVID infection and minimize any bad outcomes. So on the light uh, or early phase, you would have asymptomatic carriers. They would be typically the younger patients. They may have no symptoms at all, yet they're technically infected. They're a carrier of the virus and they're able to shed it, but they don't have any symptoms. Next, you would have people who do have symptoms. And typically the early symptoms are gonna be they're short of breath, they may have muscle aches or pains, also fevers, but other presenting symptoms include change in taste or smell or diarrhea. So the next step in that risk stratification is to say, is that somebody young and healthy or do they have other comorbidities such as age, obesity, diabetes, or hypertension? And then we look at what their oxygen saturation is. So you all have probably seen the little pulse oximeters that you put on your finger. If the numbers are consistently staying above 92, you're probably good to go and can be treated as an outpatient. And if you have one of those comorbidities, that's when this bam lem imivab monoclonal antibody may be helpful for you. If, however, your oxygen saturation drops below 92, certainly below 90, in the setting of somebody who doesn't have COPD, and usually it's a little bit lower number than in that case, um, you need to be hospitalized. There are some patients who can be discharged with home oxygen, but by and large, most of the patients, if they need oxygen and they have comorbidities, they need to be admitted to the hospital. And why is that? So you can give them oxygen, so you can give them IV therapy that really is not available as an outpatient uh, setting. Once they're in the hospital, that's when steroids and the remdesivir are going to be helpful in all the aggressive care of the patient's comorbidities to minimize advancement of those diseases as well too, particularly things such as congestive heart failure, emphysema, and diabetes. So epidemiologically, where are we right now? It, it may sound silly to keep talking about masks, even when we have these incredibly complex vaccines or um, monoclonal antibodies, but the mask is still such a simple but very effective way to mitigate virus transmission. And when you mitigate virus transmission, you mitigate the virus load. Because remember, a virus can't live by itself. A virus needs a host. It has to infect a cell and use that cell's cytoplasm and machinery to replicate or reproduce itself. It can't do so without. And so the very simple notion of wearing a mask really minimizes that disease propagation and the viral propagation. But the mask don't do anything. If you hang it around your neck, if you use it as a chin strap, if you use it as a hat, it's got to be over your nose and over your mouth. So please wear it over your nose and mouth. It's interesting, the middle thing, we talk about some of the case reports. Um, certainly we've seen some spikes um, over Thanksgiving and then again over Christmas and the holidays. I can tell you that January 2021 was a really busy time at the hospital. Fortunately, the numbers are, are decreasing dramatically right now. Um, and that's multifactorial, whether it's because of social distancing, but also I think the vaccinations are a huge component of that too. On the right, it's an interesting graph because it talks a little bit about what the observed case fatality rate is. And so it talks about not just what a country's overall disease burden is, but also what the outcomes are in those particular patients. So the case fatality ratio basically says, if you have COVID-19, what's your likelihood of dying from it? And early on in the pandemic, our numbers were upwards of 15% and sometimes even higher. But now our case fatality rate is down to 1.8%, which is really a, a huge improvement over where we were initially. And it's a testament to the dedication of the people who are doing all the background work in, in the labs and the research um, chambers. So where are we logistically? We've made incredible improvements there too. To the left is a picture of some rapid uh, antigen assays. At Meredith, have been proud to work with Sharonda. We have um, the Abbott um, Binax now, which is the first rapid antigen test that was out on the market. We've been doing um, testing with that and we're part of a multi-center national trial um, that continues to look at that. So again, thanks Sharonda, because you've been just phenomenal in making this a success. Some of the other logistical considerations, um, in addition to the N95s, fortunately we have more of those in stock, so we don't have to reuse those as much, but also we have these things called PAPRs. So when we're in high risk procedures, such as intubation, which means we're putting a tube down somebody's throat, so our face is a foot from the other patient's face, we're at the highest risk, we have maximum protection. 
To the right is the new unit that I talked about at Meredith. It's a brand new unit. Um, there are some limitations on visitation, again, simply to mitigate the spread of disease. But you can see here, at least the family can go to the outside and, and visit with their family to some extent, certainly better than not being able to see them at all for perhaps weeks at a time. And then at the top, we do have some challenges too with supply and demand. Uh, this is a picture of the negative pressure room and uh, you can see on some of the busy days we do have patients coming in um, more than one at a time and we get those patients into a, their own private room again to minimize um, spread their fully monitored rooms uh, and we're able to take care of them as soon as we can so what about nationally where are we going well i think with the masks um, that's going to be a big thing and now with the vaccines we may be able to get by with a little bit less of the physical distancing. So this chart is really key about the vaccines and it seems like a really busy slide, but it sort of gives an overall view of how many vaccines are on the market right now. The Moderna Pfizer, um, these were the first on the market and these are an mRNA vaccine. And what's significant about that? Well, the mRNA, it's a less stable um, molecule and that's the reason that they have to be kept at these ridiculously low temperatures. And that makes distribution of them a little bit more of a challenge than otherwise. However, they're unique because what they do is they make your body develop the antibodies um, that create the vaccine. So instead of developing them in a lab, the mRNA is actually injected into your body. That then gets into your cells and your cells manufacture um, the the antigens that create the antibody response and helps you fight the disease. AstraZeneca uh, came out as well. J and J is one of the more traditional vaccines that has the typical DNA strand. And because it's DNA, it's a more stable environment. It doesn't require the cold temperatures for transport. And also it only requires one shot. So what about the effectiveness of vaccines? Well, a lot of people have said, well, look, if I'm comparing the one on the far right column, I want to get the 95%. I don't want to get a 72% um, J and J. But the important thing is this, it's not trying to prevent you from getting the disease at all. If all you get are, let's say three to seven days of muscle aches or pains, runny nose, sniffling, that's not a big deal, right? Certainly that's not how you want to be, but it's better than the alternative. And we know from the numbers at recently just passing the threshold of having more deaths in the US than World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War combined, that this is a bad disease. It's still a big thing. But what these vaccines can do, even at a 72% efficacy rate, is it can prevent you from getting hospitalized. And that's clearly a surrogate marker for disease progression. So if I can prevent you from getting so sick where you don't need IV therapy, where you don't need oxygen, where you don't have to be in a hospital bed, you don't need ventilation, be on a ventilator or an ICU. That's a huge win-win. The other thing that's important to note when you look at these trials is that it's very difficult to cross compare trials because each trial had its own population. So one may have had a higher percentage of healthy patients and one may have had a higher percentage of elderly patients or patients with comorbidities. And so you would expect if you have a group that has more healthy patients in it, you know that their likelihood of disease progression is lower. And consequently, the results of that study are gonna show a better outcome. And so it's really difficult to cross compare the trials, but the take home message is this. Number one, with millions and millions of patients who have had the vaccines, we know that they're safe. Again, we know that they're safe. Most of the trials that are put out for new medications coming on the market, it might be 10 to 20,000 tops. And those are big studies. We have millions of patients. So we know that these vaccines are safe. But more importantly now, we know that after two months of vaccination distribution, that they are incredibly effective too. That it gives you a high degree of productivity, of hospitalization, significant disease progression, and significant barrier and safety against death. So one thing that has come up also recently has been the variants, the COVID-19 variants. There have been three out of UK, South Africa, and Brazil. It's interesting to note that although they do have a higher transmissibility rate, that their mortality rate seems to be fairly equal. But the challenge is this, we don't know yet for sure what the degree of efficiency or efficacy is gonna be of the current vaccines on the market against these new variants. 
And so I wanted to sort of go over the development of vaccine with you at the bottom to give you an appreciation for how they come about. So in this top left box, it's a picture of COVID-19 virus. So again, it's a coronavirus and the typical seasonal influenza virus is in that same family. But where they differ are in some of these spike proteins and in the RNA that's inside the capsule here. So what happens is that the virus comes up and it attaches itself to one of the host cells. So everything to the right of this line, this is all the host cell. That's the inside of your lungs, as an example. Well, these little purple things are receptors on the linings of your lung called ACE2 receptors. And that's the thing that the spike protein that you all have heard about attached to. Well, once you get that lock and key fit of the spike protein and the ACE2, then it allows the virus to get inside the cell. But once the cell is inside your house, that's when it's able to use the cell's cytoplasm or its own machinery to replicate and literally go viral. Once that happens, then the viral replication occurs, the cell lyses, and now you have exponentially more viral particles released inside the body and the sequence continues. So how do we prevent this? Well, one of the thoughts is if I can get the genome sequencing for one of these variants, then I can figure out what's the DNA sequencing specifically for that spike protein. And if I can figure out what that spike protein variant is, then I can create an antibody to it specifically. And that's exactly what's done. So in the bottom part, what they've done is establish some of the uh, viruses, the variant viruses, they infect hamster cells. The hamsters in turn produce antibodies. They may not survive, but they're producing antibodies. Well, then you can extract those antibodies and manufacture that at high rate and develop a vaccine to let your bodies do that as well. And so what happens when you get the vaccine, it allows your body to create these antibodies. And so that when the virus infects you, whether it's the typical SARS vaccine, or pardon me, the SARS virus or one of the variants, now you have the ability to identify this variant. And so the blue thing, which is the antibody that attaches to the spike protein, and by doing so, it prevents that spike protein from attaching to the human cell or your lung as an example, and it can't infect you. That's how it works. So I think I'm really optimistic about um, where we're going with this. It's been an incredibly fast way to develop vaccines, but also be able to pivot so quickly to uh, variants as, as they come up. And we know that that's gonna happen because that's exactly what viruses do. They continue to survive by mutating and forming variant strains. So globally, um, I think it's really important for us to pay attention to our medical infrastructure, not just nationally, but also globally, because we're very much interdependent, again, both epidemiologically, as I've shown, and logistically, but also medically. And if you like, this is an interesting review article in the Wall Street Journal from Sunday, February 13th to 14th. It really goes through each one of the steps about what we need to do for our infrastructure globally. I think it's important that although the business model over the past one to two to maybe three decades has been just in time inventory to minimize our overhead costs, we really can't do that in the medical community. Because if we do, we can see that we have absolutely no buffer. We have no safety net. And as a result, when an epidemic comes, to say nothing of a pandemic, that system is clearly going to be overburdened and there's an incredibly high supply demand mismatch. So we have to invest in our infrastructure so we have the resources to stay on, to stay on top of these global diseases. And so with that, I really want to end on an optimistic note. I think we've made incredible strides with COVID-19, both in identifying it with our tests, whether they're rapid antigen tests or some of the PCR tests. We've identified how the disease progresses and as a result to risk stratify patients and really target how to treat each one of these patients depending on where they are on that stri risk stratification um, profile. And as a result, you've seen that our case-based mortality has come down remarkably from early on when it was 15 to 20%, and now in the US we're down to 1.8%. That's an incredibly high improvement rate. Again, we still don't want to get the disease because it is highly transmissible and it is still significantly uh, fatal in certain circumstances. And that's why the vaccines are so incredibly important. We really have to dampen this down globally. It's not just herd immunity, so we still have to wear masks. Uh, we still have to do the physical distancing and just be prudent. But also I'd say it's a time to really 
underscore not just looking at the health infrastructure, but also look at your own infrastructure. So if you do have diseases, whether it's diabetes, high blood pressure, COPD, congestive heart failure, please make every effort to optimize that. Do what you can. Lifestyle modification of weight loss and exercise. Stop smoking by all means. Uh, have a reasonable diet and take the medication so you can stay on top of your disease. So with that, I really want to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. I hope I've given you some pearls that uh, have given you some insight into the pandemic um, and also given you some ideas about how to minimize your risk and, and those around you so that we can really conquer this disease, not just for ourselves, our families, community, but also the country. So thanks so much and I hope you have a good night. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for sharing your insight and your expertise on this timely and important topic and for being part of this video series. You have given us a lot to think about and really enlightened us on the pandemic. We want to thank each of you for watching this special presentation today with the HCC Alumni Association. And if you have suggestions for topics for future videos or you would like to be a presenter, please contact the HCC Alumni Association at 240-500-2346. That's 240-500-2346. And contact Lisa Stewart at her email address, lsstewart at hagerstowncc.edu. Thank you.